Hey there, React Finland. I'm Holly Gibson, a developer at Smartly.io. Perhaps you've heard of us. We automate every step in social advertising to unlock greater performance and creativity. We work with some of the most advanced digital customers, such as Uber and Zalando. We were founded in 2013 by two Alto students and now have over 400 employees in 17 offices across five continents. Our whole engineering team is located in Helsinki. We have multiple full stack teams that support different business functions. We are fully autonomous and most of us develop our own microservices and work closely with DevOps, which provides lots of opportunity for learning. We are huge fans of using React with TypeScript and have over a million lines of React across our repos. We Smartlys are proud to sponsor React Finland. We hope you enjoy the sessions from your sofa. Stay safe. I'm you, from Futurist, and I would like to warmly welcome you all to this year's React Finland. We're super happy to partner up with React Finland again to bring this great community together to learn and improve ourselves as software developers. At Futurist, we build digital services and products together with our clients. We combine software development, design, and data science to build great products and user experiences for the end users. I hope you all have a great night today. And if you want to learn more about us, let's get in touch. Enjoy. Hello, React Finland. This is Esa from Gofore. I work as a senior UX designer I'm also a developer, mainly building apps with React nowadays. Let's talk a bit about design systems. In my opinion, design system is a constantly evolving set of documented principles, a communicated process and a toolkit on how to deliver enjoyable end user experiences and services in digital context. On choosing solutions, you should consider your specific context, for example, the scale of design. Mm, it also helps to know your platforms. For example, if you're working in web context, you should understand the web specific stuff too. As a designer, you often act as a salesperson in your organization for design systems and you must convince the people around you. Of course, it's a bad idea to do something just because other people are doing it. Also, consider that design system is just one part of building great products. Future of design systems. I think design systems are here to stay. They may change over time and evolve to some new forms, but we still need a way for the designer and developer to find a common ground, a common vocabulary, a common set of know-how on how to build the product you are doing now. Web is a platform that cherishes unique visual looks, so it's unlikely that one size fits all solution will be found ever for design systems. So how do you get started with design systems? You should first talk to people around you. 
the people you work daily with. Find out what specific needs different stakeholders have. If you are convinced that a design system is what you need, you should really try to sell it and understand what is the goal you are trying to achieve. In the end, it's a question of how do we increase quality and how do we measure our results? What is the defining goal for you? Is it monetary goal or is it just the idea of creating great products? Think. That's all folks. Tweet me if you have some questions. Se on sitä, että voi elää enemmän ja paremmin. Kun ihmiset, järjestelmät ja laitteet pelaavat saumattomasti yhteen. Kun löydämme uusia tapoja tehdä asioita ja homma toimii. Se on sitä, että saamme yhdessä aikaan jotain, joka on paljon enemmän kuin osiensa summa. Siinä on vähemmän pöhinää ja enemmän arvoa. Digiarvoa. because I get to work in really interesting client cases, use cool technologies, and I get to choose my own tools. I also like the varying projects. I won't be stuck with any specific tech stack. I like Columbia Road because it's a crossroad between the technology and business. Working here is challenging but interesting at the same time. I love how we always strive for excellence. I love that people are helping each other so actively. Whenever you need help, you just ask in Slack and there's multiple people who will answer you. Our oh, equality, transparency and the opportunities to learn more. I like the flexible working hours. I love my coffee breaks. I really like our high quality green tea and coffee at the office. We know when to be serious and we also know when not to be serious. Of course, the parties are good. Come our after works and yellow trains. We're singing 90s rap karaoke at our after works. I love people at Columbia Road. They are so nice and awesome. I feel like I'm working with my friends. A sense of family and community. Fantastic colleagues. The most fun and the most professional people in the industry. I like the amazing people that we have. The people. People. People and the atmosphere.
Excellent, excellent. Uh, hi, everyone who's just joining us on the public stream. Uh, my name is Yanni, and this here is Juho, uh, the organizer of, of React Finland. And we've just come from the private session where Juho just gave an introduction to design systems. Uh, Juho, do you feel already talked out, or are you are you up to having having a chat? Yeah, we can we can chat. Yeah, because it's uh, so. Did you have? I didn't check out the Slack because I'm the, I'm I was too busy with my slides. So did we get any good questions, or do we have something in mind? Um, well, we haven't yet advertised the Slack, um, so I feel like we didn't really drive people to um, to the right place. So maybe that's a good place to start. Um, we'll do a bit of an intro um, intro here for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, then we're going to start the program, and there's going to be an opportunity to do a Q&A after every session. Um, the Q&A will be on the React Finland Slack. So if you go to um, if you go to uh, react-finland.fi and you find the Slack logo at the top right corner over there, um, that'll take you to the React Finland Slack. And from there, um, you'll be able to ask us questions uh, in the sessions after every talk and in the panel that happens uh, with all the presenters later today. So uh, no questions from the audience for you yet, Juho. Um, but I do have a question for you. Yep. Um, did you ever do any design work yourself or are you coming at this from purely from a developer angle? Uh, it's it's a little bit mixed because I mean uh, uh, let's say I, I like art I like drawing I like painting I'm not the worst painter in the, painter in the world so I, I like to sort of uh, go more into this uh, design direction I find it really really cool so it's sort of uh, tapping into this art artistic side and bringing it into all of development I think that's that's uh, really the place to be for me at the moment. Yeah, I mean that, that. That's why I think like this. The, the session today, uh, or the whole topic of design systems, is very interesting because I started very similar to you. Like I also have a more of a creative, artistic self identification, and I started as a designer developer, and it was like super easy to communicate between the designer and the developer because it was just like your right brain talking to your left brain, and like you know there was not a lot of tools required for that. Like you know, like that collaboration to take place. But now all software is so goddamn complicated and like it takes so many people um, to do it and no one person can really hold it in its head. So that's why I think, uh, you know, this whole whole uh, design system topic is uh, is something that if developers aren't yet working, working on, um, it'll become more and more relevant as kind of systems get more complicated. Um, yeah. the, the work that you do now, you have, like as a, you know, as, as a professional, you're building a design system, right? Or, or what are you doing? Uh, actually, I'm uh, working with American client, and we do performance-oriented work. So it's very opposite of my personal work. So the performance work is interesting by itself, but it does not improve with design systems. And the design system work is, I think you will learn more in my session, but it is something I do for, for myself because I learned a lot about design systems during the past few years as I worked with the topic. And I, I feel that there is, I can do a lot in the space. Because, uh, I mean, you, you always get you get familiar with the problems, and then you see that can be done better, that can be done different, and then you have your own set of problems you want to solve, like I have, and then you take all this knowledge, and then you try to put it in the system. So it's going to be very interesting for me to show what I've been up to for for last month or so when I, I've been building my own tools. Yeah, I'm super looking forward to that session. Uh... So for, for those who are still dialing in, uh, we haven't yet really kicked off the event. This is uh, just a little informal chat that we're doing. Um, later on our la last session today, Johan and I will having a little Q&A where I will uh, be uh, an idiot and ask him a lot of stupid questions about what he's working on because I legitimately am very, very wide-eyed uh, and, and impressed by by the work that Johan's been doing right now with with Deno and Ocean Wind and, and you know uh, these other modern tools. Um, Juho, um, I think are we waiting for uh, waiting for uh, Shoripo to join us on this um, on this call uh, before or let, let me let me check. I think because uh, uh, yeah, it's actually an interesting situation for us because we <laughs> we, we are short a speaker, so we have like uh, let's see if he shows up. Because uh, maybe one option is that uh, we're going to shift the schedule around, so maybe we take my session first. Because both are live, and when Sharipo comes uh, around, then then we could have his session. But it's uh, let's see. Sure, it wouldn't be live television if it wasn't for uh, you know all the, all this excitement, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's the kind of excitement you don't need to the LFC. <laughs> I'm I'm sure Yuhis is there sitting on his couch looking at you know at a big Chromecast TV with a bowl of popcorn and uh and uh and, and a beer open right now. Um yeah. watching with with excitement of, of what's gonna go down. So uh for everybody who's still joining the stream, um, you know, we're we're gonna start kick off the program in, in just a few minutes. Um we're still figuring out the the ordering of the presenters as we're having um having uh you know some some uncertainty about about the whereabouts about one of our speakers but we'll be uh um we'll be starting with something in just a few minutes and since you're all here for all the talks anyway the order doesn't really matter we haven't really carefully concocted a a sort of educational program where one thing leads to another it's more of a pick and mix back today so um yeah. i think we're gonna be yeah, just I think it's fine. Not a big problem to change the order it's uh you know it's uh there was this cool saying about something about adapting. It's uh, wait a moment. It's, it's you know Clint Eastwood, and he was saying improvise, adapt, or overcome. So I think it's uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, um, I, I I'm pretty chill. Uh, I don't I don't know about you, but uh, you know you you are the organizer of the event event, so you have a lot of this uh, um, a lot of a lot of this cognitive load on right now. But uh, we will. Uh, we will make it through. I'm I'm here just to uh, crack a couple of jokes and uh, ask you stupid questions. So, yeah, sure. So I, I think we're gonna have to make a decision very soon. Maybe, and uh, maybe we do it so that we, we go with my my part first because I'm I'm speaking already, so I'm I'm warmed up. So <laughs> yeah, and so we, we jump to my session first. Uh, then we have this uh, second session that's going to work for sure. I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have Shodipo's session, Ho hopefully as he shows up. Or otherwise, uh, maybe we do some live coding or, or other stuff. But I, I'm sure we can we can do something cool related to design systems today. So maybe, maybe we go to the intro slides and, and jump to my my presentation, but it was supposed to be last, but it's going to be the first. So. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, all right, perfect. Um, so let's uh, let let's get this uh, show on the road. Um, can we have the slides on uh, for the for the introduction? All right. Uh, welcome everyone for the third mini conference of React Finland. Um, as as you may know, uh, we were planning on having a real life conference in Finland, but then you know due to some unforeseen. Uh, global circumstances. We are now all doing this from the comfort of our own home. Um, but it is a conference in Finland, um, so not much is changing. Uh, there is pretty much exactly as much small talk and hugging as there would be in a real conference um, in one of these virtual ones. Um, it, I feel like Finnish people haven't really been that uh, you know, affected by, by all this remote conferencing and remote working. Uh, because we all have high-speed internet and we generally don't like to talk to each other anyway. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone for uh, for React Finland uh, mini conference number three. Uh, my name is uh, Jani Evakalli and I'm the master of ceremonies for today. Um, we have uh, three great talks uh, for you today, um, going in, in slightly um, out of order. So last one today, uh, we're going to have a talk uh, with uh, Shodipo. Um, talking about design from the dimension of open source. Um, basically, how designers can participate in open source, um, you know, how do kind of design systems play into this? Um, and this is a very interesting uh, talk for me at the moment, because I'm working on, a, on an open source product uh, where we would really like to have more designers be involved. And therefore, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing what's up. Um, then our second talk is going to be uh, about building React UIs visually. So the holy grail of the design developer interface is instead of having to have a, have a handoff where, where you know, designers design in one tool and developers have to use those static assets in order to implement it in another tool, uh, we could have just a single um, you know, designer-friendly set of tools that allows us to build fully interactive production-grade React UIs visually. And this is what Yang Shang will be talking to us about. Um, and then first, um, you know, before we get to uh, those two talks, we're going to have a little interactive Q&A with Juho Vepsalain and the, the organizer of React Finland. Um, he's been working on some really cutting edge, um, you know, design system tooling 
uh, using Deno and Ocean Wind. And I'm super excited to hear more about that since I know literally nothing about any of this. Uh, now, uh, before we get tar started, um, you know, I, if you know you are watching this in the premium stream, then you already know about the premium stream. But if you don't, you won't. So, so we're essentially running two streams right now. Uh, one of them is the free stream on YouTube, where we, you will, um, you know, be able to watch these talks live. Uh, but the QS, Q and A's and panel. Um, are only available later on video. Uh, and then on the premium uh, stream, which is for people who are either ticket holders to the original um, React Finland conference or have purchased the React Finland online Miniconf premium stream ticket, um, you, you're watching this on Vimeo um, and we're going to do Q&As and panel live and you'll be able to participate in those Q&As uh, yourself. Um, we're going to be doing more of these, uh, more of these mini conferences basically once a month or so. Um, next one's going to be in October, and we're still looking, um, you know, for uh, for papers for for that and all future events. Um, we already have a theme for next event. Uh, the theme will will be uh, lessons learned, uh, and so far we'll have uh, you know two speakers confirmed. Uh, we'll have Diego Haas uh, from Reactit and Luke Jackson from Ocean Wind, um, which are you know two of the projects that you know, um, or one of those projects is something that we'll be talking more about uh, today. Um, so we do have one slot available for, for next events, and then all future events are still open. So please do submit your papers um, for, these, um, uh, for these events. Now, um, if you are on the premium stream, uh, or whether you're not, um, you, you can chat at Slack. You can find the React Finland Slack group at react-finland.fi. If you go to the top right corner of the um, of the React Finland website, you'll find a little Slack logo. And from there, you can get an invitation to the Slack. And there we have a channel um, very conveniently named RF 2020 MiniConf Q&A. Um, there, basically, if you put in questions there for any of our, any of our sessions today, um, you know, you, we, we will be asking those questions live um, if you're in the premium stream. And if not, then you know, you'll be able to uh, watch those afterwards in the recorded Q&A. Um, and of course, um, none of these events would be possible um, without without our sponsors, who you know are really really instrumental in making these community events happen. Um, you know, extra special thanks uh, to our gold sponsors, uh, GoFor, Futurist, and Smartly.io. Um, and thank you, of course, to all of our sponsors who make these events possible and free um, on the public stream. And uh, you know. Just, just generally, thank you. Um, we, we will also next year, you know, if 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 uh, COVID forbids, uh, we'll be running a real live conference. Um, but if if not, then we'll be running a, a online conference. And by by then, I'm sure that we'll all be all be used to what that reality looks like. Uh, but we do have dates, whether live or 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 virtual. Um, and those will be from the 24th to the 28th of May this year. Um, tickets are available um, and it gives you also full access to the online mini conferences um, and, and the premium streams thereof. Now, when you're on the Slack or on the Q&A or, or you know, interacting with any of the React Finland community, um, you know, we do expect you to put your sort of best and most inclusive foot forward. Um, we are committed to providing a friendly and safe and welcoming environment for all regardless of their gender, sexual orientation, ability, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religion, lack thereof. Um, we are following the Berlin Code of Conduct. You can, you can find that uh, on the internet, uh, berlincodeofconduct.org, I believe. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you are unclear as to you know, what that code of conduct pertains, or you want to know more about um, you know, what, what are the expectations, you can read there. And, and you can contact the community organizers, the conference organizers um, through any medium, either Twitter, email, or, or the Slack, um, if there are any issues with uh, following this. Now, um, let's kick off and go to our uh, reordered first event, uh, which will be our live interactive uh, Q&A with Juho Vepsalainen, uh, where we'll be talking about building design systems with Deno and Ocean Wind. Um,
Oh. All right, so so we, we we got a message from from our uh, from our uh, back studio over there um, that you know to keep the program running smoothly, um, we'll go with the uh, order that we've announced. So Yuho, it's it's you and me live in the studio. Gives you animation library, but then you have to spend a lot of time figuring out what which one to use. So I started doing this catalog, and then a couple of Ukrainian guys came to me and they were saying that yeah, we're making this catalog as well. So maybe just combine forces, and then we did this web-based one. It's it's uh, really crappy, but it sort of works. I mean, it's it's the same categories. Uh, it has a lot of broken links and whatever. If you did this did this right, it, it would have value. I think the only thing of great value is the mailing list. So every month I send people a lot of links. That's like thousand subscribers or something. I don't know how they find the list because it's difficult to get the list, but yeah, whatever. So we, we did, did, did this site. And then a couple of years back, maybe four or five years back, I started writing. So I started writing books and then I did this site. And you know, because I, for whatever reason, the, a tool that didn't exist for React that will let me generate uh, a site because Gatsby didn't really exist yet. Started about the same time as, as my project, Antwar. And it's not even my project. There was this Swedish guy that brought a generator that, that I liked. Uh, and he was doing something right, but it was also missing something. So I rewrote the whole thing a couple of times. I added a feature called interactive rendering. So you could say that you have a piece of React code here that has interaction. So it has a button, and when you click, click the button, then it has to do something here, or, or it has a table of contents or whatever, where you want a limited amount of interaction. Uh, the point is that you don't want to do single page app. You still want the static site, but with, with this little bundle, bundle here. And uh, what I did, I did this double bundling process. So I first do generate the static pages, and then I extract the uh, interactive pieces, yeah. and then push it through React, and then I have little interactive runtime. But uh, as you can imagine, it's little, it's not the fastest, but it's not the slowest, but it, it's something I want to get rid of. So then a, a while back, I started thinking that maybe I could like take this side and that side, combine them into one side. I want one side, I, because I want to kick this domain out. I just want that it read, read directs to mine. And I want that the catalog is here and everything is nice and so so then I was thinking that man, now is the time. Now is the time to do a like a design system and there are tooling around this problem. So then I started writing what I called the Tailwind Web Explorer, because at the at the end of last year, I found this uh, there was this tool called Tailwind. Uh, it's for styling CSS, uh, and the background is that uh, there was this client. Uh, they wanted a new site uh, and. And they came to me and they were like, we have layouts and we want you to code the layouts, but you can use everything you can, uh, everything else would react. So I was forced to write this uh, site with HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And I was like, I don't want to write CSS anymore. So can I use Tailwind? And they were like, yeah, you can use Tailwind. And then I, I was writing Tailwind. And th then I figured that it's, it's not that bad. It's actually a great idea to use utility classes because it's very close to team UI. So we have this sort of mapping between team, U team UI and Tailwind. Only problem was that uh, when you write vanilla JavaScript, uh, it, it gets really boring boring to write the logic. So then around, it was maybe January or so, I was thinking that maybe I can push the state into HTML because if I, if I had this thing, uh, I mean, I go to state uh, because what I what I normally have, I have logic like tabs, like you, you know this basic thing. Uh, and what I found out is that 
it's actually a great idea to have this state in HTML. So now, so far I have styling, uh, I have state, but I, I was missing third piece of like what third piece I need. And then for whatever reason, I, I discovered the third package. It's called typed HTML. So let's hope it loads. So what's typed HTML? It's, it's, a, it's a package nobody knows. It's so, it's so hipster that nobody knows this, but it's also super cool because uh, what they do, they, they transform from a JSX to, to a string. And uh, you know that what that means. It, it means I can, uh, I can take this idea and then I can put it inside the function and, and use my state management solution and I can use Tailwind and I have quite powerful approach for writing components like in React without using React. And that's, that was exactly what I wanted and needed. So that was sort of the background of, of why I started writing this starter. All right, well, we definitely need a time out here at this point and we need to talk about some of these uh... Um, some of these technologies, because uh, you know, I, I pride myself as being relatively up to date, but we are now so bleeding edge that my eyes are bleeding a little bit. Um, yeah. So, so let, let's get from the starting. So, this is is this a static side generation approach, or is this a server side rendering approach? Is this a client side single page applications? It's a uh, it's a static side generator, and uh, to make things worse, uh, I refactor everything. So, a lot of this stack you see here doesn't exist anymore. But that that's that's sort of the maybe I just show you what I what I have right now. So I, I, I started from Tailwind WebEx starter. And what happened after a while? I I kicked out Tailwind. I kicked out Webpack. So I don't have Tailwind anymore. I use Tailwind through OceanWind and I use instead of Webpack. Uh, maybe I can even show you what I did with Webpack. It, it's quite horrible in the end. I mean, you could not write this without having some experience. So you have 300 lines of Webpack configuration, and and it, it, it even has some bugs in it. So there were some issues I could not fix. And then what happened next? I I found this cool thing called Deno. So they published the uh, 1.0 around May, and I was always curious. I mean, it's like Node. You see Node, and it has this. Ryan Dahl wrote this, so it, it must be good. So I was like, now it's time to try this because I, I want to get rid of Webpack. So I was like, let's do it with Deno. So I will show you the current current version that's uh, that sort of uh, works. So, so I'm going to start the server. So now all I have in the place is, is development server. It's enough uh, it's enough to prove this, that this thing makes sense. There's still some things to implement. It's not a complete solution. It's not something I, I can use in, in production yet. But it's uh it's starting to get there. So okay. Actually, okay, okay, okay. So I, I think you know, did I get this right? So you're building essentially a static site generator, but instead of using the node JavaScript runtime, you're using the deno TypeScript runtime, which correct. doesn't really have like a, like a package JSON or doesn't really use like traditional package management. But you're still somehow using these traditional JavaScript packages like OceanWind and typed HTML as Deno dependencies. Yeah, I mean that. So I started using Deno like three weeks ago, and it's a really weird process because what's going to happen is that I mean I started with package JSON, and then then what happens is that you start removing dependencies. Like I don't need Prettier anymore because Deno has Prettier. I don't need the uh, chest anymore. They don't have something for testing. I, I don't need this and that. So in the end, you reduce the package JSON, uh, and, and then one day you just kick it out. So I don't have package JSON in the project anymore. And I'm using their their approach. So I mean, they, they point, point to resources through URLs. So that, that's one of the things. You, you kick out NPM. So you're like removing a lot of things. And then you're like, aha, I can use URLs. And it's like, then it makes sense. Uh, the, the weird thing is that first you feel like, it, why do I do this? It doesn't make any sense. And then it's like, why do I do the NPM by? Because that doesn't make sense. So it's like this uh, transition from uh, NPM model to this. And it's, it's, I'm still like going, undergoing through this uh, 
like I'm becoming a Deno Deno programmer step by step, but I'm starting to appreciate what it offers. So it's really okay. uh, it's mind blowing stuff. And, and so, so this this Deno land um, place where you download these packages from is this like a CDN that's mirroring npm or is it its own package registry that's completely different source of truth? So it, it's its own registry. So when when it comes to like consuming Deno. Uh, there are a couple of these. So you have Denoland, and th there was this uh, other place uh, I forgot. And then, I mean, there's one more option: is that you can you can do so something little. I, mean, I, I don't know if it's nasty, but I mean, because you still have npm, and npm has one million packages, and and then you have, uh, let's say, unpackaged. So you have these CDNs, and that host host what npm has. So they're CDN for for, or to mirroring npm, so you can go here and you can like get get any package. Yeah, so now I have a package, and if you get a little bit lucky, you can consume this code from Deno. So you can you can essentially use uh, the registries or some third party registries. You're not like bound to one registry. You can consume from different sources, and as a fallback, you can use uh, this npm mirror. Or as a fallback of a fallback, you can do some lib directory where you put the JavaScript and then you hack around like with uh, Prism. I mean, this code will not work with Deno unless you do a little wrapper for it. So it's uh, you have different options on how to consume. So it's 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 quite more complex than in npm, but at the same time, I sort of see see the value of this approach. So, so let, let's talk about the value of that approach for like static site generation in, in particular. What do you get uh, from Deno in this case that you know, like that that you know makes all of this additional sort of like learning and complexity worthwhile uh, over just using bog standard Node? I mean, that, that's uh, it's a very good question. So, because uh, I'm still like discovering the values of or value what I I get, but it's uh, it's TypeScript out of the box, and these days. I think a lot of people agree that this will develop with TypeScript out of the box. Uh, so you have something that's somehow modern, and it, it has very good utilities. Uh, so you, you don't, I mean, that's uh, that's the code, about 100 lines of code that's replacing my my webpack configuration, more or less. It, it, it needs a little bit more to be complete. But it's, uh, I, actually, I, I know the perfect example. So. Here, I think I have, uh, I have the server running right now. And what, what will happen with uh, with my old solution based on Webpack is that I will compile my own whole static site before I can develop the site. So it will have to go through every single route in the system and make a bundle. And after that, I can, I can connect. But in, in this approach, it's, uh, it's doing something different. So let's go, I have too many tabs. Let's go here. So I have the thing running here. Uh, so let, let's see. So I have here. I go to the blog. Uh, you see, it, it connects again. But the the point is that it's it's doing this uh, work. This, I mean that that's working on purpose. But uh, because it, it doesn't work, that doesn't work yet. But it's uh, you see, it's doing this. Um, it is uh, work on demand, so it, it's not doing lots of compilation before. I mean, it, it's doing some type checking at the moment. I could get rid of that, but it's uh, generating a page on demand in development. And and you see the implication is that when I, when I have a page, when I have a site that has thousands of pages, and I don't have to do this pre-compilation, you can see that I'm saving a lot of time. So it's uh, like that, that. That alone is is one of the biggest wins I get. I mean, of course, I could do the same approach with, with Node. I mean, there is uh, not not saying that I cannot do the same with Node, but it's uh, that's where it went with with Deno. So, uh, so basically, yeah. you you have no bundler running during the development. You don't have a webpack or anything like that. So, what kind of web server do you have running here? Does it does it have a web server or is Deno so somehow it, supporting the server? Itself. So, what we see here is the server itself, and uh, I'm I'm using uh, maybe you know. Uh, so there is this framework called Koa, and then someone went and wrote the framework called Oak, 
it's, it's a little abstraction over what, what Deno is doing. And it's, it's somewhat, somehow similar as Koa, but uh, I have this tiny, let's say, app application app. And then uh, this is my, here I capture any request, and then I map from request to some HTML response. So here's my, my server. That's, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take so much uh, code to write some server logic. Yeah, this is very cool. So, so I, I totally see as a nerd, as a, you know, as somebody who enjoys just like poking into new technology, I definitely see the draw of this. Um, what about on the kind of like on, on the consumer side, like if you imagine, you know, pursuing this path down its sort of logical conclusion, what, what do you think that, you know, this, this um, stack that you built here, um, how can this be better than, you know, what our existing sort of you know, setups are for for doing whatever this is. Is it static side generation? Is it design it's system? Is be, it a bit of both? Yeah, it's, it's going to be static side generation, but uh, I mean, I, I think uh, what I want to provide as well is, is some kind of a good set of components to start with. So, because so normally you start like, I mean, of course you could say that it's simple to extract the static side part of, out of this, but I think there's, uh, there's value having, having both. So from a uh, I think if I do my work right, uh, and if I implement features like incremental compilation for big amounts of data, because uh, if you consider my use case, I have thousands of thousands and uh, thousands of pages. Let's say I have ten thousand pages, and I, I change some content somewhere, I still not have to recompile everything. So maybe I add incremental compilation. So I, what I want is to provide some kind of good performance out of the box, uh, and one of the ways how I want to provide that is that I'm, I'm working with uh, a new bundler called uh, SWC. It's written in Rust, uh, like Deno, and it's, it's really very, very fast. So now I'm like uh, playing with it a little bit. So the Deno integration with SWC mm -hmm. is, is not perfect, but I think it will improve in the coming months. But uh, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a big win, win alone because so for, for some features, like here for for design system for, for just to get this code here, I have to do some parsing. I have to go and, and find the right uh, function in the code. I have to extract the code. The same is for for prop type extraction. So I have to do some AST operations to get get the data. Uh, so so I think uh, SWC is it's really a, it's a great uh, great tool for doing it. Oh man, course, this, yeah. this this reminds me of like the early days of React five six years ago when, you know, you, you somebody would be working on something, and you know, it's cool, you know, it's gonna be, uh, it, it it's going to you know question a lot of sort of like existing ways that you've thought about building software, and you kind of like have to do this like personal calculus of like how much effort you're willing to you know you're yourself put into like digging into these new things versus like just letting other people figure it out for you. So I guess is that your motivation here? Is like you wanna you wanna do the digging so other people don't have to? Yeah, I think it's going to that direction because I mean literally today, I mean I, I found a bug in SWC and then I go I went to SWC Slack and I I, I was just saying that uh, I noticed this behavior and then then one hour later there's a fix. So it's like uh, you're trying new things, you're finding things that don't work and then get them fixed. It's, it's like with uh, maybe we discussed this uh, ocean wind a little bit before we finish. With, with yeah. Own, um, ac yeah. Actually, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that. But before we do, just a quick reminder that um, you know, if, if you do have questions uh, for for Yuho, um, you can drop them into the RF twenty twenty mini conf Q and A channel on on the React Finland Slack. But yeah, so I definitely wanted to talk more about the design system part of it since it's definitely the theme of our our event today. So, yeah. Ocean Wind typed HTML. Uh, let me see if I got this right. So. Um, typed HTML is essentially a JSX syntax that gives you TypeScript type checking over HTML, make sure that you're passing the right things in the right places, uh, and then it just generates HTML on the back of it. So it's not a full React runtime, it's just a JSX syntax, is that correct? Correct. So it's, it's mapping, uh, I can even show the code, I think I have it somewhere here. I had to fix it somehow, but it's, uh, let's see. So that, I mean, that's the type definition. I think the type definition can be improved. 
So I have some very quite strict typing. Uh, then I describe events. This could be better as well. Uh, and then that's the interesting file. That that's uh, that's the file that re that's replacing React, React uh, create element. So it, it's actually taking uh, JSX, and, and you see a lot of code. But the, in the in essence, what it's doing, it's mapping from JSX to strings. That's that's all it's doing. It's doing this just. It's you like think that JSX is a template, and and that's it. It's a sort of super simple idea. And once I saw this package, I was like, that's exactly what I need. Because uh, what I want when I, I, I write my, my code, so let's, let's give some little example. Let's see, maybe we go to this blog. I mean, uh, or, hmm. OK, that's, that's using block index layout. So I have design system layout, block index. So here you see I, I use my, my primitives. And then let's say I was working with this system. So now that's what I want. So I want when I when I make a mistake, I want a type error. So that, that's exactly what I get. And I have a very, very strict system that, that's forcing me to do this thing. So I, I cannot like go and, and forget to put size because it's going to force me to put the size there. And they're like uh, things like uh, you see the typing works so well that that's Martin X. That's like X Martin. So I, I cannot put anything that's invalid in the system here. So I, I write, wrote quite uh, strict typings. So that the sort of things you can build on top of that. So when, when you design components, you can make this interface very, very strict. So it's it's difficult to break. But and and of, is that is that style interface then where the ocean wind kind of library comes in. Okay, yeah, OK. So let me explain about ocean wind a little bit. So I, ho I hope you get this point of Tailwind, that in, in Tailwind, you have these utility classes. Each utility class, it, it maps with some CSS. And uh, from my point of view, the problem is that with the Tailwind, you have to purge. They call it purge, purge CSS. So there is this little tool, purge CSS. Because uh, the, the way Tailwind works is that you have this very big CSS file that's, that's all the rules. And then uh, you're picking up rules from that. And then you use Perch CSS uh, to get only the rules you want or only the rules you're using in the code base. And that, that's something that's quite brittle. Because if you have uh, a class name that's dynamic, that's somehow you're producing it with code, it's going to break with this tool quite uh, easily. And then one day, I, I got somehow lucky because I, I found this new project called Oceanwind. And I was like, a couple of days, I was just looking at it and thinking, is it just the thing I need and want or not? And then it, it happens to be the thing. Because it's uh, in this demonstration, and the, in the next Rec Finland event, you, you will get the author to explain better. But in this demonstration, you see we're mapping from uh, from uh, from Tailwind uh, classes uh, to, to actual code in runtime, and uh, it's it's uh, what what he did is is super super smart. So let, let's see if I can find the file. So he implemented uh, the grammar of Tailwind uh, like like this. So there is a there's a longer story which you will learn more about, but it's uh, there's a grammar. That's mapping from a class name to, to classes, so they, they don't have this problem we have in, tail, in Tailwind. And the way I integrate to Oceanwind is uh, is quite simple in the end. So in the in design systems, in the design system, I have this uh, what I call box. So that's the basic primitive of the system. I mean, it's a lot of code, and it will take a lot of explanation to understand what it's doing and how it works. But here, I have what I call O, o for O for ocean wind, and in in one place in the system, I'm I'm mapping from a, a class name that I give to class name that's in in ocean wind. So that that's doing the like the mapping, uh, and, and it's 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 doing the like the important part in on, on this component side. 
and the other other part of the of the problem is that I mean how do we know that uh, or how do we get the CSS uh, how do we get the CSS from from those so it's using uh, something called ocean o t i o n underneath and it provides what we call get style injector so we we create instantiate this one so now we have injector and then then we do something here so now ocean wind is running i mean we, we call the styles in in, a diff, in different ways and and this thing here is is going to capture all the calls so this thing knows we did we did margin four, we did padding two, we did different things. And this thing knows everything we did during this process of rendering the HTML. And then we get the style tag, and that gives us uh, the CSS we need. That, that's how, I mean, it, it, it looks, it's not that many steps. It's like this uh, integrate on the component level and capture, and then put it to HTML or, or separate CSS. That's, uh, that's how OceanWind integrates to this kind of system. And and so it has some kind of like client time, uh, client side runtime, right? Like it's not a, no. it's not a server side only tooling. No, yes and no. I mean, in my system, uh, what I get is static, static CSS, static HTML, no runtime. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the funny thing is that he he started from runtime, so he wrote this as a runtime, so he could put this, put OceanWind to browser. But my, my problem was that I wanted to use this on the server side. So you know what happens next? Then I, then I spend uh, some time, you know, let's do server side rendering. Because uh, Ocean, it, it supports server side rendering. So all I had to do was to expose some things. And uh, that's how we got server side rendering to Ocean. Wind. But I, I think Luke will tell more about this. But, but in my solution, you get very powerful styling approach without the cost of having a runtime. And it's really quite cool. That is very cool and true testament to open source. So um, we only have uh, one minute left on the time slot, then we're gonna do a Q&A. Um, we can dig a bit deeper into this uh, during the Q&A as we don't have that many questions on on Slack yet. Um, but yeah. I'd like to, to kind of conclude our, our official presentation portion here. Um, what is this project that is called Tailspin, is it available somewhere? Can people use yeah, it? Sure. Can, yeah, you, you can find it uh, in server.js Tailspin. I mean, uh, because of reasons, uh, I had to show it too early. So it's it's not complete. It's not something I, I will use for anything. It's more like exploration. And uh, for me, it's exciting because I get to learn a lot about, I mean, I didn't know Ocean Wind. I didn't know Deno like a month ago. So uh, I learned these new things I didn't even know exist, or I, I knew they don't exist, but I mean, I, I didn't know how to use it or what's the point, but now I, I re really see the point. So it's sort of like, if you want to hack around this, I'm of course happy to hack with you, but it's uh, it's more like personal exploration at the moment. So would you would you recommend if somebody got inspired by everything that you know you're doing here? What would you recommend as a path for them? Would it be to look at these underlying libraries that you're using and contributing to those, or would it be to go make your own experiments? Or like, where is where is this in in your mind right now? I mean, uh, you can all, of course get in touch with me and we can do something together, or 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 you can look. I mean, it depends on your stack. If you, if you have a, a stack and you want to use Olson Wind. It looks like uh, it's quite simple to integrate. So I mean, this integration part it, it's a little rough on the edges, but it, it's really cool. And I, maybe look into Deno, like start right. with Deno. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, well, we're at time. We're gonna do a Q and A now. So um, anybody who has questions for uh, for Yuho about his projects, uh, please do head, head over to the React Finland Slack, uh, and there's the channel RF twenty twenty mini conf Q and A. Um, we have a
T-minus 30 seconds. here today at the rise of Putulong in Tampere 2019. That's where societal impact, learning and personal growth come together. We have a successful launch of Futulong 2019. Reporting that the beer chill down procedure is proceeding nominally and the coffee machines are loaded. Every morning when I wake up, I think about the colleagues I get to work with every day. I'm really proud of the team that I'm in right now. Every day in Digia, I get to come in and face new challenging programming issues that we have. So I really like that about the workplace. In the current project, uh, I get to work with uh, very hot topics, which is on the market right now. There's, for example, microservices they talk about a lot, and also cloud computing, etc. If you're still searching for your path in the technology space or want to try new technologies or push your career, I think Diga is definitely the place to apply for. You are learning uh, many different ways that are going to be are really useful in the future. Not just technology, but also like how to build a company, how to build a team, how to manage all of that. You have a lot of flexibility to deciding what kind of projects you, you want to work. You can move from team to team and work more focusing in front-end stuff if you want, or you can learn more about uh, I don't know, like data science, for example. And Smartly uh, offers really great opportunity if you want also to see the like, customer perspective. You can travel and meet these customers that are using your product, also participate in the events that we are organizing with that kind of customers. Uh, me, myself, I have the opportunity to be also speaking in those conferences and talking about how we develop the product in Smartly, what are going to be the new things that we are bringing on. Usually our customers are really, really advanced, so you always learn uh, how to even bring the product forward and you get really good and good feedback about the things that you Moi, mä oon Mikko Kuitunen. Mä perustin Vincity vuonna 2007 työpaikaksi, johon ei vituta mennä töihin. Edes maanantaina. Tässä ollaan onnistuttu varmaan aika hyvin, kun kerran meidät valittiin Euroopan parhaaksi työpaikaksi. Alussa meitä oli kaksi, nyt jo monta sataa. Me toimitaan Hervanan lisäksi Helsingissä, Savonlinnassa ja Piilaaksossa. Saimme lentävän lähdön, mutta puoli vuotta perustamisen jälkeen ainoa asiakkaamme antoi tulosvaroituksen, lopetti hommat ja pian oltiinkin konkurssin partaalla. Kovalla työllä siitäkin selvittiin. Aina välillä joku pahoittaa mielensä meidän toiminnasta. Ollaan esimerkiksi haluttu palkata lisää naisia, ja pidetty positiiviset yt-neuvottelut. No, jos kukaan ei suutu, mikään ei muutu. Vincitin bisnestä on palvelumuotoilu, ohjelmointi ja muut ATK-palvelut. Ja me ollaan saatu toteuttaa todella mielenkiintoisia projekteja. Kerron muutaman esimerkin. Lähes kaikista maailman sairaaloista löytyy lääketieteellisiä härveleitä, joita ollaan oltu toteuttamassa. Sitä paljon puhuttua IoTtä tehdään muun muassa metson kivenmurskaimille ja muille liikkuville työkoneille. 
Oral hammaslääkäreiden sähköä haaha, se on varautunut vahvasti mukana. Superoperaattor autopesuloiden kaikki teknologia on meidän kehittämään. Sitä on käytössä Suomen lisäksi muissa Euroopan maissa, Australiassa ja Jenkeissä. Myös Hesin mobiilisovellus on meidän tekemä. Sillä pystyy kätevästi ohittamaan jonon. Vinsit muuten on latinaa ja tarkoittaa voittamista ja valloittamista. Ja sitähän me ollaan tehty. Kasvamista tärkeämpää on kuitenkin se, että meillä on aina huomenna tyytyväisemmät asiakkaat ja tyytyväisemmät työntekijät kuin tänään. Columbia Road because I get to work in really interesting client cases, use cool technologies, and I get to choose my own tools. I also like varying projects. I won't be stuck with any specific tech stack. I like Columbia Road because it's a crossroad between the technology and business. Working here is challenging but interesting at the same time. I love how we always strive for excellence. I love that people are helping each other so actively. Whenever you need help, you just ask in Slack and there's multiple people who will answer you. Wow, equality, transparency and the opportunities to learn more. I like the flexible working hours. I love my coffee breaks. I really like our high quality green tea and coffee at the office. We know when to be serious and we also know when not to be serious. Of course, the parties are good. Copyright Afterworks and Yellow Trains. We're singing 90s rap karaoke at our Afterworks. I love people at Columbia Road. They are so nice and awesome. I feel like I'm working with my friends. A sense of family and community. Fantastic colleagues. The most fun and the most professional people in the industry. I like the amazing people that we have. The people. People. People and the atmosphere. our next session. Uh, thank you, Johan. Okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. All right. And um, welcome back to the public stream. Uh, we just had a Q&A uh, with Juho where we discussed basically, well, where the direction of the bundler, bundlerless ecosystem uh, in web development is going um, and the sort of like the, the, the next uh, era of, of web uh, development and the web platform. Um, if you if you didn't catch that, you can catch that later on on the recorded Q and A. But now it's time for us to go to our next talk. Um, our next talk is uh, by Yang Shang, and it's about a topic that I think you know all of us uh, web developers or, or product developers have been you know thinking about and wishing for the long time, which is that could we have a design tool that designers and developers could use um, that you know builds maintainable, production ready, presentational sort of UIs um, that are ready to ship to production. Um, so Yang has been working on a tool called Plasmic, um, and this is uh, his presentation about what he's learned and what are some of the challenges uh, building such a tool uh, and what the tool itself uh, can do for us. Um, let's, uh, let's tune in for Yang's presentation. Take it away. If you're a developer on a product team today, you probably know about design tools. Developers uh, sometimes get to work with product designers or UI designers, 
uh, who use these tools like Sketch or Figma. And uh, these are basically vector drawing tools. You know, they're very good at uh, letting you quickly mock up UIs and explore lots of different ideas rapidly without investing the time into uh, necessarily writing any code. But then when it comes time to collaborate with engineering, that's where things can get uh, complex. You know, engineers have to essentially recreate the UIs from scratch by hand using code. And inevitably, a lot of things can get missed in this translation process, or, um, or it can just be hard to translate because you know, designs are freeform drawings. And so this leads to a lot of back and forth with design. And uh, ultimately, you have these two sources of truth that, by most teams' admission, are uh, never truly in sync. Now, there are visual creation tools that let developers um, actually build production UIs. And uh, they're nothing new. They're actually very widely used on other platforms like iOS and Android and Windows, but not really so much for the web. You know, to make one that fits well with the web means uh, fitting well with how apps are written today, which uh, means integrating in a natural way uh, with code that is uh, just increasingly written using these compositional component frameworks like React or Vue. And, uh, and also UI builders are generally perceived as clunky and very technical, you know, a very far cry from the ease and speed of design tools. Uh, but anyway, on the web today, the status quo is to write everything in code. So uh, there's a question of what a rethought development experience could look like for the web. You know, how can we simplify things? There are also website builders. You know, uh, website builders are everywhere. Here's a tiny fraction of them. These can all actually be quite different from each other as well. Uh, some are simpler and more for you know non-technical audiences like small business owners. And then there's others like Webflow where you basically need to know CSS layout. But they're all focused on static websites, you know, uh, optionally hooked up to some content management system. Uh, but if you're working on a web app where you have an actual team of developers or you have uh, you know a database and user accounts and uh, I think most importantly just custom business logic, then static site builders uh, aren't really meant for that. So this brings us to the last category, which is uh, UI builders for web apps. Uh, this is actually a much more nascent category. So these logos are probably recognized by far fewer people, but it's emerging really fast. And uh, this is actually just a subset of the players. Uh, these are all about bridging design and development, um, but they all also have very different takes. So it's hard to summarize all of them together. Like for instance, modules lets you theme a design system of primitive components. Um, Hadron lets you craft web components. Visly lets you craft React components. Um, it's been really exciting actually to see all this activity and just raw tooling innovation happening. Uh, I work on one of these, I work on Plasmic. So I'll give a quick demo of Plasmic just to show one stab at what rethinking developer experience could look like. So this is Plasmic, it's a browser-based tool, and uh, for this demo, I'm gonna create to -do MVC, which um, uh, just a, re a refresher of uh, what everyone's favorite reference app looks like. I'm not gonna create the whole thing, I'm actually gonna create a subset of it. And uh, I'm also gonna create it from scratch. We have a different demo video on our website where we show how to start from a Figma file. So we have this Figma plugin that lets you turn uh, one of these Figma documents into web standards. And so that's another way to get started. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll just uh, directly draw on the canvas. Uh, you know, you can directly add text, uh, add boxes, etc. And uh, the whole idea, the whole workflow that Plasmic really tries to enable for you is to just start with these very rough exploratory designs. Uh, you know, uh, not worrying about layout or anything like that. And uh, I'm, I'm drawing this box for the task and and the checkbox in it. I'm going to make the checkbox rounded. And um, you know, here I'm just starting by creating these wireframes, and um, uh, the idea is that you should be able to start with these and then refine it into something that's real, that's robust, that has you know proper layout and everything. So um, the idea is just start from scratch, refine, 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 and you end up with something that you actually ship into production. So uh, this task, uh, I could now copy and paste this a bunch of times to have a list of tasks. Um, but you know, now if I actually want to style this thing or update one of these, uh, then um, uh, I have to do that manually for all the different copies. So instead of that, I'm actually going to right-click this and create a component out of it, a reusable component called task. And now if I paste this a bunch of times, uh, then I actually get um, instances of the same component. So if I update one of these, if I double-click into an instance, I'm editing the primary copy of the component. So if I 
uh, you know, drag this around or, uh, you know, move things around, then you can see all the instances update as a result. So I just kind of, you know, drew some boxes. That's pretty much it for my uh, wireframe of what I want the app to look like. Now from here, I'm going to start applying styling to make it look more like the real thing. And uh, I'm going to start with this title here. I'm going to make it super thin and I'm going to apply some coloring to it. So maybe this light red color and this background here, the whole page, I'm actually going to set to be this uh, off white, warm gray, something like that. And uh, this task itself, I want to be just pure white. And uh, this checkbox, I actually uh, also want uh, that to have a light gray border and uh, just get rid of the background there. Um, and I'm gonna fidget with this text a little bit. It's a little small right now. I'm gonna make it larger and uh, just adjust its position a little bit. I'm gonna uh, set its text color to be uh, something lighter. Uh, I'm gonna make it, you know, maybe something like that. And I'm actually gonna save this color as a a reusable color token called text color. And so, um, you know, color tokens, spacing tokens, mix-ins, these are all concepts in Plasmic that let you create, you know, more maintainable, scalable designs. And, um, and uh, you know, actually, they're very close to what you get uh, when working with code. So, um, now, I have this uh, list of three tasks, and they're just kind of haphazardly placed. Uh, let's say I wanted to introduce real layout. So what I can do, um, one way to introduce that is uh, I can lasso these into uh, basically a vertical stack, like so. And these stacks keep everything distributed and organized. Um, these are actually powered by Flexbox. And you, know, you can see the controls for this. But um, you know, we really try to streamline and simplify a lot of layout in CSS. And uh, to show that, I'm going to right click this background to get rid of it. And um, I can. Basically, uh, for instance, uh, for this container, I'm just going to snap everything to the top, to the left. I'm actually going to double click this uh, bottom edge to auto size the content vertically and also in the horizontal direction as well. So these are some of the um, uh, simpler features of the layout, and we'll see some more interesting features in, in a little bit. Now, uh, I have this you know element here, uh, this this container. Uh, I'm going to give it a name as well. I'm going to call it task list. And you can name elements just to keep your uh, elements organized. And also, um, this will come in handy later for the actual code generation part. Uh, these three tasks, they currently are kind of boring because they all say the same thing. I want them to be different. And in fact, I want the text to be variable. So uh, what I will do is uh, double click this again to drill into it. I'm going to right click this text and uh, convert it to what's called a slot. And uh, slots are kind of like poking a hole in the component. So from any one of these instances, I can select that slot and just change its text to make to do app, uh, you know, show demo, etc. Uh, but you can actually fill these up with arbitrary content, any number of elements. Now um, that is uh, almost it for my app. The only other thing I wanted to do is actually design these tasks in their different states. And this is, you know, just a very a common thing for components in React. Uh, certainly, you want to make them appear differently in different uh, different circumstances. So uh, I will um, instead of actually just keep double clicking into this task to keep editing it, um, I'm going to right click this and pop it out into its own new artboard on the side. And this is so I can edit it in uh, isolation. Um, if you're familiar with you know React Storybook, it's the same general concept of just working on things uh, by themselves. So um, here, uh, I'm going to start showing this concept of variance and the way that you know uh, state and uh, variations of a component are all modeled in in Plasmic is through this unifying concept called variance. Uh, and I'm just going to show this in action. So I'm going to create a uh, a variant group called states, and in, inside of states, I'm going to create a variant for you know uh, what my task looks like when it's marked completed. Maybe I want to design what it looks like when it's uh, being edited and when it's uh, marked high priority as well. So these are different states that, it, that this uh, component can be in. And uh, for this exercise, I'm just going to design out what the completed state is. And I want there to be a check mark in this checkbox. So I'm actually um, going to screen grab this uh, check mark from here because I just like the look of it. Um, so I'm going to screen grab that like so. And uh, back here, I'm going to paste it in there. And I'm going to zoom in actually to a pixel level to uh, adjust it. Uh, I can also use real layout for uh, adjusting this. It doesn't really matter in this case. Now, um, 
uh, after I do that, I, I can actually switch between my base appearance and my completed appearance. So you can notice that uh, those changes that we made were actually just getting recorded specifically for the completed state and not affecting the base state. Um, these are not different copies uh, of the components that I'm looking at. These are actually, uh, the completed state is just a set of overrides or, or deltas on top of the base appearance. So to show you what I mean, I'm going to clone this artboard and have it sit uh, side by side. And I'm going to set the bottom one to look at the base appearance and the top one to look at the complete appearance. And uh, you know, if I make more changes to the base appearance, um, you can see those bleed through to the completed appearance, but um, it, any changes that I make specifically to the uh, that are getting recorded to the completed appearance will stay uh, within there. So uh, as another example, I'm going to make this text strike out and uh, change its text color to be lighter as well. So um, you know, you can just change any part of a component like this. Um, uh, now the thing about variants is that you can dynamically combine any number of them. So uh, for instance, I'm going to introduce another variant here uh, for my hover state. And um, hover is actually just a very common interaction, uh, similar to pressed, et cetera. So there's like this special built-in support uh, for those states. Um, and basically, whenever I hover over any part of this component, I want this box here to become darker. So I'm just going to scroll down and uh, change its border color to become darker, like so. Um, so uh, now I can actually uh, try this out in preview mode. And I'm hovering over this thing. OK, so that's close to what I want. But I actually realized another thing that I want is for there to be a, uh, for this uh, cursor to become a hand pointer as well. So I'm going to just set that here directly <coughs> and preview again. OK, so that's a lot better. Um, and uh, the thing about these variants is that they come with the component wherever it goes. So back in my main screen, I can select any one of these instances. I can change it just for the purpose of mocking up uh, you know, into, for instance, a completed state. I can also preview this whole thing and uh, just play with it. And it, it's a little nuanced, but you can see we're dynamically combining the completed state and the hover state here with this middle guy. So that is pretty much it for designing out this app. Uh, maybe the last thing I'll do is tighten up the layout, the whole thing. So I'm going to set it to be a column layout and uh, center everything and maybe add some padding uh, to the top and bottom here. <clears throat> like so. And uh, I'll turn this whole screen into a component as well called to-do app. So now my project has these two components, my to-do app component, my task component. Uh, from here, the this, this part is the interesting part, which is how do we work with it from the code? So one way to get started is actually just uh, through our code sandbox integration. And you can click this button and just spin up a sandbox and you have basically this, uh, you know, this uh, asset running as a standalone web app. Um, that you can directly start uh, mucking with the code for. <clears throat> but more interesting for us is actually uh, generating code into our own local code base. So um, there's this client that helps you with that. And I already have it installed, so I'm going to skip this step. And the two other steps are basically uh, running plasmic init. And this is just a command you run every time you want to get started using plasmic in a code base. So I have here in my terminal um, this, uh, basically, it's a blank create React app. And just to show you what that looks like. Um, you know, it's just a spinning logo. And I'm going to run that plasmic init command here. It's going to ask a bunch of questions that I'm going to answer with the defaults for. And the only other command here is this plasmic sync command, which is what actually pulls down the components from the project. Um, so I'm going to go back to my terminal. And so now we have this uh, to do app and task component synced down. And I'm going to pull up my code editor. Uh, on the left and have my running app on the right. And I'm going to replace, just the first thing I'll do is just get things on the screen. So I'm going to replace all this boilerplate with uh, just rendering this to-do app, like so. <clears throat> and uh, now I should see exactly what I created in the design tool showing up as a uh, pixel perfect component in my actual React app. From here, you know, this is still the static mock data. So uh, let's say I wanted to replace it with my real data. Uh, so what I can do is I'm going to double click this to-do app to drill into it. Um, this file has a lot of comments, but uh, I'm going to get rid of these so you can see that it's actually uh, just a very simple file. Um, this whole to-do app component is actually just a thin wrapper around the plasmic to-do app component. So the plasmic to-do app component is this dumb presentational component that handles all the rendering. And is uh, this is actually generated by plasmic and is regenerated by Plasmic. Um, and we'll see that in a little bit. But 
Tudo app itself, uh, this this whole file is just uh, a skeleton starter uh, f that's uh, generated for your convenience. But you can actually do whatever you want with this file. Uh, you know, you as a developer own this file. So, um, for instance, if I actually wanted to start introducing state or um, behavior to this, I, I can just do that here directly. So I'm going to start by adding uh, some state for my tasks. And let's say my uh, task objects are just simple JS objects with an uh, in property, do stuff, like so. I'm going to have three of them. And uh, now I'm going to wire up this, uh, this Plasmic To-Do app component with the actual uh, uh, tasks. And to do that, I'm going to reference one of the elements that I named previously. I'm going to reference it by name, so this task list. I'm going to replace all of its contents with uh, my own set of tasks. And to render these tasks, I'm going to use the other component that we synced down, this task component. So now I have these, uh, you know, these three, um, uh, my own data showing up in the app. And so this is how you can work with the um, the plasmic to, uh, these plasmic components. Uh, is you can just uh, flexibly wire up any props that you want on them. Now. <clears throat> The real highlight of uh, Plasmic is that it's not just a one-time code export, but you can actually go back into the editor and make changes to your design, and uh, those will be kept in sync with the code. So um, I'm going to run Plasmic Watch, which is just this mode where it'll live stream any edits I make in the editor into my code base. And I'm going to have the running app on the right <clears throat> and the editor on the left, like so. Um, I actually don't have a ton of real estate here, so I'm gonna, it's going to feel a little squished on the right. Uh, but now let's say I wanted to make some, um, you know, violent changes to my layout. So uh, instead of this vertical list, uh, let's say I want it to be a set of tiles. So I'm going to double click this component to start editing it again. I'm going to make it look boxier, uh, something like that. Uh, I'm also going to start applying some real layout to this. So it's a row, uh, top aligned, and uh, maybe with some padding all around. I'm going to take this checkbox and pop it out of its place so it's free floating. And I'm going to drag it down to the bottom right of the, of the task. <clears throat> and I'm going to pin it to the bottom right, actually, like so. Um, and uh, that's it for what I want to change my tasks to look like. Now, this is still a vertical list, and uh, I want this to be a set of tiles, um, like a, a rows of tiles. So I'm going to change this thing to go from column to row. Now everything is spilling over the, on the right, but I'm going to turn on wrapping so that things wrap around. And um, I'm going to make it fixed size so that's actually centered in the screen. Uh, it's a little hard for me to tell apart the different tiles right now, so I'm also going to introduce some gap in the uh, vertical direction and also the horizontal direction. So you can see some of the fancier features at play with the layout engine here. And uh, if you think about how to implement things like, uh, you know, a cross-browser gap uh, in a way that is um, that is friendly uh, with, uh, you know, uh, things like wrapping and doesn't introduce uh, selector specificity issues, uh, it's actually, you know, uh, quite annoying to do. So um, these are examples of things that are just very common when it comes to layout tasks and that uh, Plasmic tries to make as simple as possible. So anyway, you could see that as I was making those changes, these were getting live streamed into the um, into the actual app. So that is uh, pretty much it for this quick tour of Plasmic and what it's all about. So now I'd like to pull back the curtain a little bit and talk about uh, some of the challenges that went into building this thing. Uh, you know, including both technical challenges and product challenges. So uh, the first one I'll start with is uh, just the state management infrastructure. So you know, this is a very sprawling client application with uh, a lot of complex states, and uh, you know, it's state that is constantly changing. And there's also a lot of surfaces that are reflecting out various parts of that state. And uh, there are certain operations, uh, certain interactions, like drag operations, where um, if you want it to be smooth, which means uh, if you're shooting for, let's say, 60 frames per second, uh, then you typically have a frame budget of around 16 milliseconds. And uh, if you want to make sure you're not busting that budget, then what that means is you just want to make sure you're doing the minimum amount of work that you can get away with uh, you know, per frame. And so this is where a lot of uh, tools like state management frameworks come into play. You know, they're all about uh, minimizing in various ways that are you know uh, more or less uh, er ergonomic for developers, uh, just minimizing the amount of work uh, that React does, the amount of re-rendering that you do in response to state updates. Um, but what makes uh, this application tricky is the combination of latency with scale. So uh, to show what I mean, um, 
this example here, uh, we have a canvas with these three artboards, which is a pretty simple project. But uh, if you imagine a project with you know hundreds of artboards on the screen, uh, then things get a lot dicier. You know, um, uh, what you don't want to do is to simply naively uh, just make a synchronous update to um, uh, to your state and then have everything render as a result. Uh, so an example of a thing we do instead is we break up our updates into small chunks so that we can incrementally and uh, lazily evaluate these updates, uh, these re-renderings, I should say. And, um, and so uh, we can actually see this in action. So as I am uh, dragging around this uh, checkbox here, you can notice that um, if you watch the other artboards, uh, there's a slight delay and lag uh, between when i moving this one around and when these others update. And uh, that's actually an artifact of our scheduler in play. So, you know, there's a uh, prioritization of these different artboards where, you know, the one that you're manipulating directly is highest priority. Uh, the things around you are uh, lower priority and the things off screen are lower priority still. So um, that's one example of a way we actually break up some of the work here and, and then actually uh, prioritize and schedule them. Uh, another uh, important feature of Plasmic is uh, one that I haven't shown uh, in this demo is code components. And this is about uh, the ability to bring in your existing React components, maybe from your own code base, maybe from a library like Material UI. And uh, there's a lot of challenges here, such as uh, simply making it easy for users to bundle up the components um, uh, that they care about without becoming experts in Webpack. Uh, or uh, just dynamically loading the modules into the runtime so that, you know, because you're essentially uh, injecting this foreign third party, co third party code uh, into the canvas um, and you want to do that in a secure and isolated way. Uh, but, okay, so even once you have your material UI button showing up in the canvas, uh, how do you actually configure it and work with it? So that's where Plasmic's language tooling comes in. And uh, this is basically about you know crawling your code base to find the components available in it and reflecting out their interfaces, you know whether it's documented using TypeScript or prop types. And this can be nuanced because there are some props that you expect to show up as controls in the right-hand panel, for instance, various knobs. And uh, there's other props like children props or function as child props where you expect to directly manipulate them on the canvas uh, through drag and drop. And um, and you know, on top of all this, there's uh, these additional problems uh, that I haven't talked about, like uh, just harvesting out examples of how to use the components, because oftentimes that's also very well documented in code bases or documentation as well. Uh, there's also a slew of uh, product challenges. Uh, so here are a couple. Uh, one is about distilling layout into a small set of intuitive controls. Uh, you know, CSS layout is uh, notorious for being hard to use, and uh, layout is just such a pervasive aspect of um, creating UIs that Plasmic really focuses on trying to streamline that as much as possible. Uh, you know, CSS comes with a lot of different concepts, you know, both legacy and modern, and uh, different overlapping ways of achieving the same thing, but you know, with different trade-offs and, and subtleties between them. Uh, you know, uh, and, and to this day, I still spend time debugging. You know, which props are, uh, which props affect the declared height of an element so that percentage heights respect that uh, and, and, and just other minutia of, of CSS. Um, and and it's actually really infuriating because <laughs> the answer changes in browsers over time. So uh, Plasmic tries to unify and simplify a lot of these concepts and uh, you know distill them into simpler controls that cover the most common cases and then give you escape hatches to actually drop down and exercise you know full control of your flex basis, et cetera, if you really care to. The last aspect is uh, something I alluded to in the middle of the demo, uh, but uh, it's the ability to um, actually bring in your designs from other design tools. And uh, there's a lot of challenges here actually just around um, mapping the concepts across these different domains because, um, uh, so this is about you know taking, for instance, Figma's uh, document representation, and uh, that actually is something that is uh, very rooted in graphic design background. So you have concepts like layers and layer masks and blend modes. And um, you know, in, in CSS, for instance, you have uh, inner and outer shadows. Uh, in, in Figma, you have centered borders. So reconciling these uh, impeden impedance mismatches is uh, you know, a big part of um, the, the product challenge there. And uh, you know, the goal is really to um, 
to automate away and, and do as much as possible of the grunt work, this like rote work of translating designs into web standards. Code integration is, I think, the most important challenge for Plasmic. If you think about what is natural for visual direct manipulation and, uh, and also what's natural for expressing in code, uh, we're essentially trying to marry the best of both worlds. And you know we're trying to find the most natural and uh, flexible interface for doing that. Right? This flexibility is uh, there, it's there for practical reasons. Right? Uh, just you know, at the end of the day, I need to instrument this element with a certain prop or uh, you know event handler or behavior. Um, uh, but there's also uh, what I'll call quote unquote aesthetic reasons as well. So you know, I want to control what my component API looks like. You know, uh, in this example. I have this task component, and it takes the child, uh, children for the content. But maybe that's not the interface I want. Maybe I want this task component to take a task entry data uh, object, right? And then internally, it can derive what content it should render, what state it should render in, et cetera, from that task entry object. So um, this is what I mean by uh, you know control over the component ABI. So our thinking is always you know rooted in just giving developers as much flexibility as possible. Uh, so that the code generation is only there to help and never to hinder. So we use Plasmic for building Plasmic, and in terms of the impact on our own workflow, there's a few things I want to call out. So uh, the first is around this design-first mentality, which is about forcing you to think about the end goal, you know, the product and the experience that you're going after, and then uh, filling in the code in service of that end goal. Uh, so this is really nice as a top-down approach, right? Making sure you're building the right thing. And bottom-up approaches definitely have their place, especially in uh, you know projects with high technical risk. But uh, it can also be more bumbling for other kinds of projects. The second impact on our workflow um, is if you are lucky enough to be working with a technical designer who uh, can wield something like Plasmic, then you know there's just something very magical about running Plasmic Sync and then seeing a nicer version of your landing page show up in your code base, um, which, uh, you know, it's definitely a direction that we want to explore a lot more is uh, running this tool to make it more accessible to a broader audience. Um, and the last uh, thing I'll call out in terms of uh, workflow impact is uh, just the elimination of an entire class of uh, visual regression tests and manual QA tools. Uh, so, for instance, you know we had these storybook plugins that would uh, help you compare your implemented components with your designs, and um, you know that's obviated by the fact that this tool is essentially a declarative language for you to you know what you see is exactly what you get in the final product. Anyway, that's all I want to share about Plasmic. It's still really early days for us, but also for a lot of the tools in this camp. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually really excited about this entire category. I think there's just a lot of innovation happening that I think could really transform what front-end development looks like. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check out these tools. Uh, we'll also be sharing our progress on Twitter. And the last thing I will call out is that we are hiring. Uh, we're a tiny team of five people total, three on engineering. So if these challenges sound like fun, then uh, let us know. And welcome back to the back studio, uh, where we're going to have hopefully a Q&A with Yang. Um, he's been hanging out with us on the back room, and we've been talking about uh, Plasmic. Uh, but we've just lost his feed, so uh, we will we'll give him you know, a minute and, um, and, and see if we, if we get him back. Um, ah, the fun live live television experience. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, for all of these talks, uh, this one and uh, Shadipo's upcoming talk and the general Q and A uh, panel that we're going to be doing, uh, please do ask questions at the RF twenty twenty miniconf Q and A channel. Um, and um, I guess I'm I'm waiting to hear from the studio to see if we uh, if we have uh, if if we have Yang online. I have been told to just entertain you um, for for half a minute uh, while we uh, while we figure out um, which uh, program we're gonna go to next. Um, usually at this time when we have you know when when we do live conferences, I would do some audience interaction. Um, but right now, I don't have any way of interacting with you. I would I would tell you to uh, you know press F in the chat, but we're not on Twitch. Um, or and I, I'd ask you. Uh, I'd ask you how was lunch, but you know who cares? To be honest, 
uh, some of those yeah, conference yeah, moors from real life, I think we're, we're much happier without. Um, so when do I start? All right, so um, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> so we're going to go straight to our next talk. Um, I'm not sure what happened. Yang was online and he was very excited to uh, talk to us. Hopefully we can get him back for the, um, for, for the panel and we can ask him more questions about Plasmic. Uh, but now, without further ado, we are going to go directly uh, to Shodipo's talk. Um, so this talk uh, for, for me personally is very interesting. Shodipo, I mean, will talk about design from the dimension of open source. Um, specifically, you know, how designers can sort of contribute in the open source ecosystem. Um, and I'm currently working on an open source product, not open source tool or library, but an actual product with a user interface. And I, I'm very keen to hear how I can make my uh, project more sort of approachable for, for designers. Uh, and also, uh, what is it that designers care about when they look into, um, you know, contributing to open source. So without further ado, uh, let's give the stage to Sharifa, who should be here with us live. Um, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me on board on uh, our React Finland conference. Super exciting. <laughs> I think it's my first time at this conference. And yeah, I'm excited. So today, um, as Janice said, I'm going to speak about design from the dimension of open source or the open source, however you want to call it. So <laughs> let's get right into it. So um, my friend of mine always said something. He said, um, open source is the new source. Like source, then source. Like <laughs> that's the idea. His name is Adewali Apati. So yeah, let's move forward. So I do um, open source. I contribute to quite a number of open source projects on GitHub, um, from Gridsum to Vasil to um, Facebook to a couple of projects on Google. And I also have my own personal open source projects that I work on. Um, so yeah, I'm also a GitHub star. So a GitHub star is a program um, that um, GitHub runs for kind of some people in southern regions. And we have about two in, yeah, I didn't mention, I'm based in Nigeria and it's an awesome country here. If you have any chance to come to Nigeria, make it <laughs> so github star um, at github moving on so uh senior developer advocate and developer programs manager so i organize quite a lot of committees here in africa that's the unstuck africa africa hacks developer circles lagos on facebook react react js lagos and open source community africa now let's get cooking so designers can't get less creative over time um the more you create design assets the more creative you get um over time uh, so you can't even give me a minute. I am having a small problem. Okay, got that fixed. So, um, sorry, looks like I'm having a problem with my slides. Oh, it, it appears now. Okay, sorry about that glitch. So moving on. So I'm gonna talk about a problem about design and um, open source, um, why designers do not like really like how open source are structured and how exactly we can fix this thing. But first, let's start with the problem of why a whole bunch of designers do not contribute to open source. This is something that we can this problem. So let's move forward to problems. So starting out with contributing to open source as a designer can be very intimidating as um, a designer and confusing based on the level of features you see already prepared with now this part is really important with little or no documentation. So usually when, when we see products over on GitHub, we see them for like engineering projects, like um, like, like for you see documentation for engineers, documentation for like other people, there's no documentation for designers, this is something we need to fix. So when you get there, it's like a whole bunch of features, a whole bunch of pages that we need to work on. And um, there's like no documentation that is based on to towards designers, it's really confusing. And this is one of the problems designers have when they're trying to contribute to open source. So next thing is the ideology of designers not needed in open source, but just make it work. A whole lot of startups and products out there are like, okay, I don't really care how um, designers, um, what I don't like, I don't care about designers. What I care about is let this product work. And this, this is this is really wrong. It shouldn't be this way. Um, design is not an ideology; it's a professional profession that people um, um, should be hired for and should be paid properly for. It's really important. So that's just two major, that's like two out of like all the problems for, if we can solve those two problems, we're gonna solve a whole bunch of all of these problems. So now um, we're gonna move to the solution. 
So number one, resources tailored towards um, open source, how to contribute open source as a designer is really needed. Thanks to organizations like Open Source Design, Open Source Initiative, and other um, organizations trying to create content based on open source design. We have all of these uh, uh, communities out there and uh, projects, companies, organizations that are trying to create content, videos, video assets, like a whole bunch of things out there. So it can help designers contribute to open source faster and easily. So they're putting things together and they're working tirelessly on this. And yeah, this is really important. And the community should be definitely be involved in this part and um, support everyone more. So the next is, we need conferences to still lots of words open source for designers on a large scale, like what is even happening right now. We need open source tailored events showing people how to contribute to open source in real time as designers, from looking at the features already available to taking this feature and um, documenting it down, um, writing the changes, then designing um, the screens out, then prototyping, then even sharing via URL on your Adobe XD. So all of those processes should be taken into accountability during this conference, and it's really important. I'm going to talk about why just in a few seconds. So again, yes, um, tools, we need more tools. Yes, developers, um, um, companies, developers and companies, they're always building tools that will help developers become um, better engineers. Uh, we need to create more tools to help also designers contribute to open source efficiently. As we're creating tools for developers, let's create tools for designers. This alone will solve most of our problems that we have um, with contributing open source as designers. So designers need to understand how to communicate with developers and developers need to understand how to communicate with designers. It's like a two-way street. It's, it's definitely a two-way street. So developers need to understand how to communicate with designers. Designers need to understand how to communicate with developers. Once we are being able to solve these two major problems, we're going to solve most of all the problems, most of all of the problems. Because developers speaking with designers, is, so design like, so developer, the designer designs, um, uh, a, let's say like a, a screen and it's saying okay um, this button should work this way this is the user experience I worked on this is the UX I worked on so it should work this way then the developer is working, working on it and the output on in production is different from what the developer prototyped and it's like hey do this this and the developer you know, is design is saying everything goes upside down because the developer doesn't understand what exactly um, the designer is saying so everything is really upside down and once designers can speak to developers and developers can understand things go smoothly. And once developers can also communicate what they want to the designers, things go also smoothly. So these two things need to, take into, need to be taken into accountability for um, a whole bunch of things to work between designers and developers. So yeah, um, getting started with OSS, open source software. So um, th basically, this is my definition of what I call open source. Um, so open source, in a nutshell, is a free software built by the community for the community with improvement shared across different technical talents. So I'm going to take that again. So um, open source, in a nutshell, is a free software built by the community for the community with improvement. developers to designers to technical writers to all of these technical talents out there to graphic designers so to open source projects together so that's basically what an open source project is to me okay. um, the only sort of Okay, so um, the web has been open source since Google Chrome released something called the web um, view page source. So the view page source basically is um, somewhere you can go to and you can see really all the HTML code of the website. So the web has been open source since when Chrome released the view page source um, feature. So once you right click, you see, you see um, an option called view page source. So once you click on this, it gives you, an, it gives you um, a whole new tab where you see the HTML code of the website. So automatically, you can reach through this and um, understand um, certain things that like needs to be changed on the website. Uh, the next thing is the inspect element part. So as a designer that understands CSS in quotation, as a designer that understands CSS, you can also use the inspect element option um, where you can um, click on that and you get to see the HTML and CSS. So you can like validate and see where certain things are going wrong. You can also do this. So um, how can designers begin contributing to open source? So the best place to start out, no matter what you're working on, is the issues tab. As, a, as designers, developers, you don't jump straight to create a pull request because you saw a problem that work that like something doesn't work properly. You don't do that. You create you go to the issues tab. If the issue is open, they already make a comment. Or if it's not, create a new issue, tag the maintainers, and talk about it. So the issues tab is the best place to start out. So 
the first thing you do is, is you evaluate the um, chosen project's workflow with experience, color combination, and every single component you need to take a look at. So every single component you feel that you want to um, change, you take a look at them, evaluate them, make document, um, write them down. Then um, once you've done all of this, then you can um, like create an issue that doesn't exist. So create an issue um, and um, tell them you're facing and the potential fix your proposal. So the next thing is, so feature, um, they must have a feature without consulting one of the project authors. Um, is a valid ad or um, how exactly it can be improved? <laughs> uh, most times we always um, start features even without um, consulting with the maintainers and we just like push a pull request and it's all upside down and at the end doesn't get merged. The best practice is always to really check with the maintainers first. This is what I want to work on and um, it's going to take this timeline and like, they're like, okay, I think this is great. Let's add it. Or we can't have this for this version. Let's move this to the next milestone. So if no pull request, you didn't tell anyone, just open a pull request, it didn't get like accepted. Everything goes to, like everything just goes upside down and it, pull requests get closed and that's a problem. Let's move forward. So yeah, next is coming up with alternative design patterns, um, but raising an issue in relation to why and how, and also timeline. So why, how, and timeline, really important. So you need to come up with design patterns that you think um, that would work for these open source projects, and um, yeah, why it should be changed, how you're gonna work on this, and the timeline you will need. You're gonna share all of these things so as to really convince them um, of the changes you wanna make and why they should say yes to this um, pull request or issue. So the next thing is, if you really want to contribute, um, if you want to contribute open source really badly, and, and as a designer, you're gonna um, want to really um, convince these people. So the first step, you need to prototype your design properly, because there are certain people that wouldn't even really believe you. If what you're gonna have to do, you're basically gonna have to really try your best to really convince them. It's like, it's like I'm a okay. I own a startup, and I'm trying to pitch to a group of VCs or angel investors. I'm gonna create. A, an amazing slide that um, put like all my um, timeline and everything on my slide. I'm just gonna like take everything out there and be hardcore with uh, my presentation to the investors. So same thing here as a designer, you have to go the extra mile by even prototyping the design assets you are doing so they can see in production how exactly it's gonna work if they actually chose that you should um, like, like just design a prototype and send it in so they can see it. So, Try to prototype yourself if you want to really convince the owner of the owners of the projects to make things like easier for you. So I start to have like a really long thread of discussion of them asking questions. Just prototype your design, send it to them, and yeah, things go great. So uh <laughs> so this part is really funny. Um so I'm gonna mention so uh myself, so I design also, but um I also do engineering. So but then these are um some crappy things some engineers say about design. I'm just gonna mention some CVI developer here. Bear with me for these few slides. <laughs> so yeah, um, some design, some engineers say design is an ideology, not a professional profession. So I've heard some engineers say this, and it's very wrong, and shouldn't even be said at all. So design is a professional profession. Um, it's a department. It is super important as the engineering team. Okay, most engineers will be clueless uh, if there were no designers. That would be so hard. That would be so hard. Like you're just gonna disrupt the whole workflow. So it's always best to have a designer in the team so they can help you get the best user experience um, on building your product. So design is not an ideology, it's a professional profession, but please, no one should ever say this. And if you see someone saying this, try to correct them in an amazing way and just get them to improve and never say this. Next is, if the end product is quality software, why can't designers code? Now, so I think this is the most popular one that a whole bunch of people say. <laughs> so if the end product is quality software, why can't designers code? Yeah. So yeah, I know like, this is actually a valid question, but um, if it's depend, depend on the way the, this question is being asked. So if the end of the question, why can designers code? Designers don't need to like, know how to code. It's not a mandatory thing, but um, what's important is knowing how to communicate with the developer so they can, you can understand what they are saying and you, can, and you can also communicate properly how the feature should work to the developer. So what's most important is the communication part, not knowing how to code. Is the communication part not doing else good? If you cannot write CSS or HTML, it's not a bad thing at all. Or if you can, it's just a plus. If you can, it's just a plus. But it's not mandatory as a designer. It's not mandatory at all. So um, design is one of the most significant um, department while building a startup product or working on an open source project. So design should never be undermined by any reason whatsoever. It's, it's an official department and it's something that should be taken um, 
with the utmost um, what watch that I use seriousness because um, trust me if your design is bad your performance is great and your accessibility is great also but then your design is crappy you will lose people you will lose clients you will lose a whole bunch of people because your design is bad so design is something that should be taken into like full accountability when working with any open source project or even like startup projects or anything at all design is really important so as I said before, the web as an open source um, for designers, also when the web inspector um, elements came out where you can live debug CSS, this is not as a design, when you understand CSS, you can read CSS. Um, yeah, you can use the inspect elements to see, uh, yeah, like the code, um, the CSS part, what exactly is causing this and how exactly it can be changed. And you can show them like a dummy version. I think I'll call it the dummy version of um, how it should work instead. That's if you can write CSS, but again, it's not mandatory. You can just make a prototype and show them how it should work from the prototype. And thanks to Adobe for creating the prototype share feature. So once you design, then you prototype on your Adobe. Um, there's a there's a tab called share. So once you click share, you create a unique URL where you can um, share your prototype to people via that unique URL. And it can literally use your application from that URL. So just share the URL to the maintainers, the user application like, oh, it's amazing. Let's make this work. So the next thing is version control. So for designers, we both know designers have something called design history. For those, uh, for anyone who has used something called Adobe Photoshop, you know, as you design on your Adobe Photoshop, automatically you have something called design history. So as you make changes on your Adobe Photoshop, your every single change you have, you've made are being locked automatically. So as you even move um, a square to the right, that's been locked. So that's the design history. And um, something like git for designers i think yeah so um so this is actually okay okay i'm gonna say this because um if you're looking to contribute with me on this um, i'm definitely open to contributions on this you can just send me a dm over twitter so i'm working on a tool that would help designers being able to to be able to um, contribute to open source so um i thought about a way so how about if people can designers can actually um design on figma um sketch app or um, adobe xd and also push their designs straight to github um, as SVGs and also retaining the prototype of these applications they have. That would be amazing. I thought about this and this is what I'm currently working on, um, but um, I'm currently facing a whole bunch of problems. But um, if you want to help on this, it's definitely open to contributions on this project. So it would be so amazing if designers can also push the project from um, uh, Sketch App, Figma, or Adobe XD to GitHub as SVG files and also import from GitHub as SVG files straight to Adobe XD Sketch App or Figma and still retaining um, the prototypes that were done initially. So um, it's really confusing, but yeah, that's just working on currently. And I think it's gonna be valid as to um, a lot of designers out there. And yeah, if you, want, if you want to help contribute to this as a designer, as a developer, it's definitely open. So the next thing is, as I said before, you have to go hardcore. If you want to really convince the maintainers and you really want to contribute open source, you love this project, you have to go hardcore. You have to also go the action of designing for multiple devices, multiple screen responsiveness, if you really want to convince them. Because you get to some point like, I want to convince this guys, I want to contribute to this project. I'm like, I'm this deliberate. I'm going to go as far as sending DMs on Twitter, sending opening issues, sending stuff into the GitHub discussion tab, even going up to Slack channel like that bad. And I'm gonna like create designs for multiple devices because I love this project and I want people to love it too because I'm a developer advocate. I want I want to make people's life easier with products that I believe in and I use. So I'm gonna make this better and I'm gonna advocate for this product even though I'm not being paid for it. it doesn't matter. So convincing people, you have to go the extra mile to do this. Especially for designers, um, you have to go the extra mile because uh, yeah, not everyone believe um, design is super important. It's just like make it work. And to really change their perspective about this, you really have to go to the out to convince them. So the next thing is, so um, this part starts writing documentation for other designers to see and follow along. Um, is a strength that someone has to start. If no one starts writing documentation, like, come on, we all have this documentation for developers and that's it, then that's a big problem. Someone has to start. So someone didn't start because they believe someone else would. At the end, no one ends up starting until probably a couple of years later, or probably again, one in tiny data, then someone um, probably, that's still like another probability, right? So documentation, but I say, let's start writing documentations for designers today. Um, this is really important for designers and it's to make them feel welcome in an open source community. And let's start doing this today. Um, 
you can tweet this if you want to let every developer out there let, let every designers out there hear about this and let them um, write documentation for designers and make them feel welcomed it's really important as i feel welcomed at when i see some documentations designers also should feel welcomed the same way you can just create a session that's saying designers then documentation on how they can contribute even the open figma file they can they can just um duplicate and make changes on make it open source the future is open and let's begin to work um along that path so i'm going to talk about a few tools about design i'm just going to run through this part real quick so for design we have figma adobe xd and sketchup for prototyping, we have InVision Studio, we have, we have Adobe XD, we have Organami Studio, we have Sketch, we have Webflow, we have Framer, we have Zeppelin, we have Flowmap. So discussion and collaboration, Zeppelin, Slack, Figma, InVision. So all of these tools, they all have um, Slack extension that you could install, that you could also track your um, um, your design and your conversations on Slack when you have a, like a private Slack channel or like a separate Slack channel for um, Zeppelin. So you get to see and track discussions from Slack and send messages from Slack and they appear on Zeppelin. So that's a process that you can work on when you're yeah, doing this. So yeah, resources are not um, openly distributed as it was today. So before it wasn't like openly distributed as it is today. Um, we have people writing articles, creating video content, running workshops, running conference talks, writing even research articles and even a whole bunch of things more. Um, today's the best time to start contributing open source as a designer. And I believe um, you should not start tomorrow. You should not start tonight you shouldn't start in the next one hour you should start contributing to open source as a designer right now you should start writing documentations for designers not in the next one hour not in the next two hours but right now it's really important and we should feel we should make designers feel welcome in the open source community and yeah it's going to make things a whole much easier so yeah um this is some resources of some companies who um have like they're big on open source um, yeah, so we have facebook google microsoft twitter and all these organizations you can take a look at Thank you very much. You can ask questions. There will be a Q&A session. You can also follow me on Twitter and GitHub with my handle is at developer.io. Thank you. All right. Hello, and welcome back to the back studio. Um, we're back here on the um, on the premium stream and talking with Charipo about his talk. Uh, welcome to the studio. Um, are you online? Here you are. Hey, nice, 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 nice to see you again. Um, Shalipa, yeah, I think you might be you, muted. Kenny. All right. Hey. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Oh, uh, thank you so thank much you. for this uh, presentation. Um, I, I My name is Josef Jastrom. I'm a senior specialist here in Futurist Tampere office. My main area of focus is mobile applications. I've been developing different mobile applications, different platforms for almost 15 years and three years in Futurist. We kind of take our job seriously, but on the other hand, we are kind of uh, not taking ourselves too seriously. Uh, lately, I've been working in this uh, like remote setup where we are doing a project for German car manufacturer in cooperation with our Berlin and Helsinki teams. So we've been doing uh, full stack web development with uh, React and TypeScript and backend side with uh, serverless uh, AWS Lambda functions. That's been a really nice project. So we were actually in Berlin for one week, uh, meeting the client and uh, getting to know with uh, other teams from Futurist. So what makes me proud is uh, being around these really talented individuals and uh, being part of the company that uh, really helps our clients to build something new. The best thing for working for Futurist, in my opinion, is the people. Uh, there's so much talent that uh, every day basically you learn something new here.
lot to work at Columbia Road because I get to work in really interesting client cases, use cool technologies, and I get to choose my own tools. I also like varying projects. I won't be stuck with any specific tech stack. I like Columbia Road because it's a crossroad between the technology and business. Working here is challenging but interesting at the same time. I love how we always try for excellence. I love that people are helping each other so actively. Whenever you need help, you just ask in Slack and there's multiple people who will answer you. Our oh, equality, transparency and the opportunities to learn more. I like the flexible working hours. I love my coffee breaks. I really like our high quality green tea and coffee at the office. We know when to be serious and we also know when not to be serious. Of course, the parties are good. Copyright afterworks and yellow trains. We're singing 90s rap karaoke at our afterworks. I love people at Columbia Road. They are so nice and awesome. I feel like I'm working with my friends. A sense of family and community. Fantastic colleagues. The most fun and most professional people in the industry. I like the amazing people that we have. The people. People. People and the atmosphere. I do like uh, different kind of games, especially board games, and I have played over 750 different board games. It was around 2004 that I rediscovered board games again and started playing a lot of them and collecting them. Ever since been one of my main hobbies. Uh, life and work can be thought about as a game as well, uh, just a different kind and more serious one. In games, you make a lot of decisions. Uh, you have some challenges and problems, and you make decisions how you solve them. In work life, it might be a little bit harder because there's much more variables, more people, more different things to take into consideration. My role at Co4 is uh, to be the head of mobile development. So that will include sales, estimations, helping other mobile developers with their skills and knowledges. It's a mix of a lot of different uh, responsibilities. I really enjoy discovering new, new things, how to use technology in new ways. Also uh, problem solving, solving something that I don't know if anyone has solved before. I've really enjoyed sharing my knowledge. I'm doing different kind of mentorings and going to conferences, learning new things and sharing that knowledge with others and seeing that they go like, aha, now I understand that concept as well. And that's really exciting to me.
separate you because we are doing an audio audio thing but maybe your your thing is, is the style guide is and your thing is the atomic layout. So maybe that, that's a good split. So so about the atomic layout I love the fact that we uh, it was CSS in JavaScript that's done differently than, than usual CSS in JavaScript. Uh, what about yeah, well I was listening to your talk so I didn't know if things happened. So to me you were excellent. Yeah, thank you. I definitely feel like the, the nine months or so that I've been here, then I, I've learned just so much. The way that the, the hiring and the sort of culture is set up here means that there's, there's just like a really great bunch of bright people. This, this attitude of uh, hiring to elevate is a really like motivating. It's another great learning experience. I, I remember like attending the first Friday demos before I was working here and like there was just some really like great feedback, great questions, it's like people like really picking into the details, not, not some high level abstract thing, but like, you know, why did you call that button that thing? And like, at first, like, okay, why is this relevant to the whole company? We're all sat here, but you realize that it's just this kind of healthy feedback working in practice, and it doesn't even matter what the feedback was, it's just the fact that a developer should expect to uh, hear feedback and learn to take it and learn to present their ideas and, and sell. Se on sitä, että voi elää enemmän ja paremmin. Kun ihmiset, järjestelmät ja laitteet pelaavat saumattomasti yhteen. Kun löydämme uusia tapoja tehdä asioita ja homma toimii. Se on sitä, että saamme yhdessä aikaan jotain, joka on paljon enemmän kuin osiensa summa. Siinä on vähemmän pöhinää ja enemmän arvoa, digiarvoa. T minus 30 seconds. We are here today at the Rise of Putulong in Tampere 2019. That's where societal impact, learning and personal growth come together. We have a successful launch of Futulong 2019. is reporting that the beer chill down procedure is proceeding nominally and the coffee machines are loaded. Working out autonomously is something that many 
companies uh, announce, but uh, in fact, it's something that is really difficult to achieve from a company perspective. But uh, I like how it's smartly enforced that every team has the capacity to decide what technologies to use and how to solve their problems autonomously. And the leadership team believe on that and give us like freedom. We decide uh, company-wise what are going to be like the objectives for the next half a year, and then teams autonomously decide how they can contribute to those goals. Each team um, is uh, trust to do the best. Usually when you start in a company, you have to just move fast and break things. But at some point when the company grows, those early days code can start to be problematic when you need to scale some part of the product. So now we have uh, taken that challenge uh, and with the help also from the leadership, like we have been like bringing this forward, like this can be a problem in the future. So they also have gave us like that kind of freedom to decide like, okay, if you think that it's, this is uh, like fixing things is more important at this moment than just building like new features on top of broken things, like go ahead and fix it. So right now we are building a new product that is gonna take care of fixing the whole things that we felt that has been broken for a while. So that brings us together to the topic of how autonomous the team can be and how what kind of decisions you can take. And in a smartly, I'm happy that you can take those decisions and prioritize over what maybe a leadership team could be considering at the moment. This is the ultimate IT brand film. The visuals are chosen by an AI, which analyzed dozens of other IT brand films. Hello, I am a deep male voice. Cybercom provides innovative IT solutions on a global scale. That's why this globe shoots out data. Pew, pew. We hope that this beautiful forest makes you associate beautiful Nordic nature with our company. Because we too are Nordic and beautiful. Here at Cybercom, we like to keep our employees happy. And that's why all the paid actors in this video will be smiling. No matter where they are or what they're doing. And what does running have to do with IT? Well, not much. But it makes for some great emotional footage. We have offices in all sorts of places, including Helsinki, Copenhagen, Stockholm, and Warsaw. But there's no skyscrapers, so this is Shanghai. We do not have an office in Shanghai. 
to us, coding is art. But according to AI, it doesn't look cool enough. So this is a painter instead. Our coders get adequate compensation for their work, unlike many artists. AI suggests that we should show a person wearing virtual reality goggles. I think he should be wearing a helmet instead. And these don't exist out of sci-fi movies. Oh dear, still so much data. We have to speed things up now. Charge my house, supercar, cute kids, woodworking, what the, what, ballpark, uh, what's, what's going on? <sighs> well, that didn't work. Hey, maybe we should use the AI to actually do something useful.
separate you because we are doing an audio audio thing but maybe your your thing is, is the style guide and, and your thing is the atomic layout. So maybe that, that's a good split. So so about the atomic layout I love the fact that we uh, it was CSS in JavaScript that's done differently than, than usual CSS in JavaScript. Yeah. Well I was listening to your talk so I didn't know if they So to me you were excellent.